Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with Kindred Spirits. As director of the Consortium on Technology for Proactive Care, I really feel um, blessed to be with all of you that really have a commitment to prevention. And our focus has been using technology to facilitate new models of care. And I think that finally, with these economic crises that are derived from the aging demographic, the health care costs, we'll, and health disparities, we'll finally have better mechanisms for funding, reimbursing prevention activities. With the new developments in big data algorithms and um, sensors, communication, smartphones are ubiquitous now, we're going to be able to really see a transformation where we can deliver health behavior change interventions that are tailored and timely, uh, providing feedback and encouragement. Um, our focus and has been on the individual in the home. And we use a variety of sensors that you see in the box on the right um, to provide input to our algorithms to assess patient state, tailor messages based on the feedback from the home, and then provide interfaces to both family members and patients for the, for example, we do a lot of consumer-based interventions that don't require a family caregiver, but many of our um, clients are traumatic brain injury survivors, stroke survivors. There's a variety of applications where you're trying to enhance the care at home, which needs to be continuous, and for chronic conditions, you're trying to prevent visits to the emergency department and most of the actions really happening in the home. So in our, in our laboratory um, at Northeastern University, we have a variety of interventions that are based on this home monitoring. Um, we have cognitive computer games that we use to monitor cognitive performance as far as divided attention, memory, executive function, verbal fluency, for example. We have socialization interventions where what we're monitoring is either time out of the home, time on the phone, time using the video conferencing that we encourage, developing connections with others, and, and emails. You know, not the spam kind. We try to not look at content or who it's from, but rather the degree of personalization so that we're collecting statistics. Same on the phone. Number of contacts and time on the phone without having to look at the, the actual content. With sleep management, we've in the past used bed sensors under the mattress and we'll first try to assess for our interventions that are mobile de delivered. We'll assess is the sleep problem due to anxiety, sleep hygiene, or circadian rhythm issues. Many older adults with cognitive decline are wandering at night, sleeping during the day. We can help try to regulate and put them back on track. Sometimes the issues are simply sleep hygiene, um, gait monitoring, medication management. There's a variety of um, applications because when you're dealing with issues at home for these populations, they're not single medical issues. They're much more broad. You look at any disease management program, it'll include physical exercise that you see in the upper right. We have interactive video ex chair exercises for people to use at home, um, where we're monitoring using the Connect camera, the skeleton image, and we can give immediate feedback to help keep them motivated. Diet and exercise are common health interventions. But what I'm gonna focus on today because of the big data issues and because of the noise, I'm gonna focus on how we are now starting to measure stress. Stress is incredibly common. 75% have experienced at least one symptom in the past month. 80% engage in an activity to try to manage their stress. Only 18% are saying that it's decreased in the past year and it has an incredibly strong impact on health. Um, for example, we know that the stress hormones affect the respiratory and cardiovascular systems in a profound way. 
Um, they cause the blood vessels to constrict and raise blood pressure, but also you see effects on almost every organ. If you look at that list of conditions, it's profound it's, and it's ubiquitous. And for prevention, the biggest issue is at the bottom here. It also affects your ability to improve your health behaviors. Now, stress is a difficult thing to even define and talk about. Here are the three most common definitions that I've been able to found, find. It's a feeling of emotion or physical tension, an automatic physical, mental, emotional response to a challenging event, or it occurs when the environmental demands exceeds one's ability to cope. But we all know, and this is just a graphic, it's not real data, but it's showing there's good stress and bad stress. You need a little bit of stress to get going in the morning. You need stress to be able to perform at your peak, but too much as those of you who have trouble taking exams, you know you can just get um, immobilized and um, it become dysfunctional with too much stress. So what we're trying to prevent, and then there's also the issue of acute and chronic stress. Sometimes stress is very appropriate. The fight or flight is a useful response, but this chronic stress that causes the bad health outcomes is so important to understand. We're not there yet with an understanding, but we do have mechanisms to manage this um, concept of bad stress, let's call. Um, so many of the approaches, um, autogenic training, biofeedback, deep breathing, guided imagery, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the most common. Um, there are technology approaches to provide this and sensors, like I happen to be looking at wearing my Apple Watch and a Fitbit, um, testing out as a test user right now two different possible interventions. Um, you'll see the Apple Watch in the, in the bottom has um, a reminder to do deep breathing for a minute throughout the day. That can be very useful. It's not necessarily targeted to when you have a stressful episode. It's kind of a random. Um, version. The Fitbit has a relax mode, but it takes so many clicks to get there and get relaxed and watch the, um, you, you know, many of these interventions, including our own so far, are causing more stress on our team than they're relieving stress. So there's a long ways to go with this technology, and you do have to be careful when you're interrupting people. That's why we're trying to make it more calendar-based location-based, understanding the context. This is just one example where we're doing some usability testing on a phone app called Wobot that delivers cognitive behavioral therapy, tries to use natural language to engage and interact with people, but we have not found it uh, to be quite there yet. But the intent is good, the movement's in the right direction, there's a long ways to go, but there's many, many of these apps out there already. One that we're working with with Duke University is the Breathe Well um, Wear app, uh, but it's delivered on a phone. So, but um, the user interface for a phone can be challenging. We're um, trying to re relieve stress in patients with traumatic brain injury in this particular project, and there's cognitive behavioral input at a at a very fairly shallow level. Now, uh, one of my PhD students has developed an, for a laptop like the one here that uses the microphone on the laptop to filter out speaking and be able to detect breathing. So he has a feather that you use deep breathing exercise to blow the feather away. You put in what thoughts are bothering you, and you blow those that text away. It engages you in a guided imagery to do deep breathing relaxation issues. He's also looked at um, Google Cardboard um, to deliver a virtual reality type of um, guided imagery for cancer patients that are going through chemo to have them, uh, they call it distraction therapy, to reduce stress. So these are just some examples. 
But, you know, we're trying to do better than this with the new technologies for stress management. We don't want just one approach for everybody. Um, it's difficult for people to remember to do the deep breathing exercises on their own or the cognitive behavioral interventions on their own. And to be really helpful, you want to measure stress in the wild without having to wear chest straps, ECG electrodes to get the higher quality data. And that's where the computational models become so important. So the way that the gold standard right now is sort of just self-perception. Are you stressed and to what degree? Often use smiley faces, frowny to smiley, or to look at mood. Um, cortisol has been used. That hormone is very slow to change. And certainly if you're measuring the hair or saliva, it's um, not a continuous measure. We've been using heart rate variability, which I'll explain in a minute, electrodermal activity, which is just measuring sweat, but it's what they use with lie detectors, you know, galvanic skin response. So it is also a measure of sweat. But one of the confounding um, variables here is physical activity. You sweat when you're very active. And there's an accelerometer in each one of these devices that can measure motion. That's how we measure the steps or measure overall active minutes. Use that accelerometer to determine when you're physically active and say, well, then I can't use a sweat measurement to assess emotional stress. So we try to separate physical stress from emotional stress to give proper feedback. Now, a third um, variable that we use is voice affect. I might sound stressed right now. So giving, giving a talk is one of the activities that we um, have students or people go through. It's sort of a known stressor, quantified amount. We also use images to generate stress, generate relaxation. Um, mental tasks like uh, difficult arithmetic, or the Stroop test that you might be familiar with, where people are bound to make mistakes when the colors and the words are conflicting. So there's a variety of ways that we can generate stress, generate relaxation to understand how we can monitor with heart rate variability. Heart rate itself is a good indicator, too, um, electrodermal activity and voice affect. So this is a quick diagram of how we can get physiological metrics that monitor stress. So our work is more on the upper boxes where the adrenal glands are going to um, generate the catecholamines and give us an indication physiologically of what's happening. The cortisol that I talked about being a more slow response is the, the lower bar. Um, so just a quick review. Electrodermal activity, heart rate variability, and cortisol are physiological. The voice affect is more behavioral. So this is what a typical sweat graph looks like, electrodermal activity. We have um, a baseline. They're shown a stressful image. Sweat goes up. And then the recovery after there's in relaxation mode. But it's not, not always, and this doesn't look pretty. This is noisy, but we can handle this. What you put on top of it are changing baselines. You can't have a, you know, a single value that's going to be your threshold, even for one person. It changes throughout the day. So we need to have very sophisticated computational models just for this one very simple measure. Now, when it comes to heart rate variability, if we had EC, people wearing ECG electrodes all the time or the chest band, great. But what we're talking about in prevention really are lifestyle changes, not a quick monitoring study. So we need to take advantage of these types of wrist wearables or a ring where the data is going to be more noisy. Instead of an electrical impulse, you're getting a optical reading through the skin of the pulse. That's going to give you your basic heart rate. We're looking at heart rate intervals. 
time between beats. Then you see that that generates this type of signal, our, our interval signal. And looking at the variability, well, if I go back, there's not, doesn't, you, you'd have to tell relative, it's the same variability all the way there. But just um, simple root mean square kind of variability gives you one feature to describe heart rate variability where decreased variability indicates stress, increased variability indicates recovery from stress. So we try to classify stress versus recovery from stress. So that's heart rate and the heart rate variability. Now, another way to look at it in a much more reliable, independent way of looking at this is to look at the power spectrum. So we go into the frequency domain. The low frequencies are going to indicate stress. High frequencies indicate recovery. And it's a little more complicated. I'm not going to dwell on this. Just to tell you, these are the types of features that we're then going to use in our classification algorithm, where from ECG, or the pulse plethysmography, we determine what the RR intervals are, use all of these different features, including the heart rate itself and respiration, which you can often get from here, to look at stress and recovery. Now, you can then generate a graph throughout the day for an individual. Green is recovery, red is stress, and blue, physical activity. That helps people get insight. When we first started working with our colleagues in Finland at Tampere University, the, um, you know, of course, we always start testing on ourselves. And we found that um, the faculty there had the highest stress when they were on conference calls with their colleagues in the US. <laughs> it's not that they knew what to do about it, but it, it was good insight. You know, what we're trying to do with providing people with visualization is how to develop insight and a coping strategy. So with those colleagues um, and with the First Beat company, we studied 19,000 Finnish patients. This is through the workforce, just for three days, but this is using ECG electrodes. So I'm first going to go through how we can, with a clean signal, relatively clean, look and understand how stress is affecting um, people. And so um, they were just measured for three days and I had daily questionnaires. So we found that gender was not a big factor. Stress recovery was not as good with age, increasing age, or with increasing BMI. And if you were more active, you had better stress recovery. However, any individual day, a lot of physical activity kind of ruins your stress recovery. So if you're more fit, you're better off. But in an individual day, they, there are a lot of athletes that are using this type of feedback to know when to take a day off from training. Now, we also found that alcohol was an issue. This is just one person who was assigned no alcohol on one day. You see lots of recovery in the nighttime on the right. Six um, units of alcohol and much less recovery. It's basically um, decreased significantly. Now, when we looked at this on the full, you know, took the questionnaire data on those 19 thousand patients, we found that alcohol on the left, you'll see recovery minutes, which you want to be high. So with no alcohol, it's high for all age groups. And tapering down to um, one gram alcohol per kilo, which is pretty significant. And um, it basically cuts the recovery time in half. Now, visualizing this, to give people feedback, there's a variety of ways you can do this. This is a type of mat where throughout the day, you've been taking stress measurements, and 
bright red shows high stress, size of the circle shows the amount of time spent in that location, and the linkages between are transits. But time in transit, say a bus, car, is right in the middle. That's where everything's linked to. This person is most stressed during transit and could, by this type of graph, perhaps come up with a coping strategy. Not stressed at home, except in the morning. So that comes out as a separate. Another type of graph that combines these two is just showing stress. This is a student taking an exam and then recovering after the exam. There's other types of uh, feedback that you can give just very quickly, going from neutral to anxious. But what we really want to do now is focus on the monitoring of stress so that we can improve smoking cessation, improve a wide variety of um, health interventions where stress can affect the um, the ability to adhere negatively. So looking at the algorithms, we've used the Microsoft Band in the past, but you know, as Fiona was mentioning, these devices are changing daily and Microsoft is out of the business now. Um, it's hard to find devices that measure both electrodermal activity and heart rate reliably and give us the data. So the big data issues that we find is that we need to be sensor agnostic. We have to be able to move from one to another quickly. Um, but we have to represent the accuracy, the reliability, how it's sampled, how it's filtered, uh, as, as, just as Fiona was mentioning in the previous talk. The cleaning of the data is so challenging with these noisy measures on a wrist device that is not always in great contact different time scales. We don't always have voice affect. We're only able to get that when they're on the phone. And we have to record the dynamic context. So as I was mentioning before, if we use the accelerometer in the devices to infer physical activity, we give a different type of um, classification than if we're sure that there's emotional stress. But also you need to know location. If you want to have an intervention that is timely, you need to understand the calendar and the context of what's going around. You will only make things worse if they're in an argument with their boss or in a meeting and you're interrupt. Take a deep breath. Not appropriate. So this has been incredibly challenging for us, but um, an important area of new research. And uh, finally, this data fusion. We need to be able to understand the reliability at a particular moment in time of a particular sensor. When do we rely on voice affect more than heart rate variability? When do we look at electrodermal activity? And how do you weight the input of all of the sensors? So just want to wind up saying that clearly stress is important. It's not well understood. It's not well measured or quantified, we would like to give it a performance metric so that um, we can distinguish good stress from bad stress. Um, the technologies are there, but it's going to take a lot more work to make it the usability appropriate. We want to be able to intervene in real time. We want to, end of day, give some feedback how the day went, how they might be able to enhance their performance in the future. But this is all going to take a lot of high quality computational modeling to have a dynamic algorithm that knows how best to fuse the data and how best to alert and give appropriate feedback and encouragement to our patients. So I'll, I'll wind up here with just thanking the team that has helped me with the stress research. Thank you. <laughs>